but God is in the healing business. Several of you received healing. Somebody in the upper back, right about here, where you've been bowed, if you'll straighten up like that and move your head around like that, you'll find that that's free. Okay? Amen. And uh, that includes those who are coming in to, uh, to the uh, garage. All right, grab your notes, grab your Bible. You ready to get into this? Okay, so let's get on. All right, so we've been doing a series called New Creation Realities. We're going to call this one Children of Light. Children of Light. You are a child of God's light. Can you say amen? Now, I don't know about you, but God says that you are the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill that can't be hidden. Folks, if you're wandering through a desert place and you're looking for some kind of a sign or some kind of a thing to use as a directional, wouldn't the light of a city be something that you want to head to? Amen. And you know, that's exactly who Jesus is. He's the lighthouse of our life. He's the balance of our life. He's all these good things. Can you say amen? All right, we're going to turn and read our scripture. Have we got it up? They look like flowers. All right. Look, uh, read along with me. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in what? That word for love there is a word that humans don't have for it. We had to literally invent a word in the Greek to describe the kind of love Jesus showed. And the walk in love is that kind of love, is agape, agape or agape, which means God's unconditional love that does not cease from giving. So the walk in love as Christ also has loved us. So we're to walk in God's love and given himself for us as an offering, as a sacrifice to God for a sweet, sweet smelling what? Everyone say, hey, you smell good. <laughs> you know, Jesus in you has an aroma. First Corinthians chapter two, by the way, there's an aroma of life in Christ and there's aroma of death in sin. Did you know, I found out, found out a long time ago, one of the ways that Satan tracks us down is we stink when we're in the flesh. We put off a neg negative vibe and it tracks them like, you know, it's kind of like going in there and attracting bees. You know, you don't want to do that. So we want to learn a lot about some wonderful things today. I hope you are taking notes. Then on the next scripture, Hebrews 13, 1 and 2 says, then let brotherly love continue and do not be forgetful to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels, and then the King James says, unawares. Did you know we're to be friendly to everyone, even those that are rude to us? Why? Now, first of all, God's people aren't rude, okay? God's godly, angelic beings are not rude. So, but we have to learn how we treat others. Now, everyone say tribulation. I want to know why we have a tribulation. Okay, because of the way people treated the Jews and the way the people treat Christians, there will be a great judgment upon the world on that fact, because who do Christians belong to? And who do Jewish people belong to? Amen. So when the world treats you unfairly, God will step in and repay whatever evil is done. So that's why he suggests that we don't put matters in our own hands. We don't take the law into our own hands. We turned it over to God and he literally does it better. Can you say amen? He's just, he's fair, and he's thorough. Sometimes we need to sit God on people because they're so bad. It's okay because you know it's going to turn out good. Guess what? What, Sherry? You sick God on me? Thank you. Because God is always going to do good. Because our God is good and perfect. So when you say, Lord, boy, that enemy, boy, that guy at work, man, he's just really on my case. Lord, I bless him. And I sick you on him. Change his life. What a weapon. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You're Christian. You're supposed to be doing that. Somebody treats you unfairly instead of you popping off, bless them. 
Let me tell you real quickly, and then we'll get into this. I was writing with a friend. Hopefully, they were watching. His name is Brad, and uh, and his wife's name Cheryl. I won't go into last names, but he drove a gut truck. A gut truck is one of those lunch trucks that come around the different companies, you know, and serve lunches. I, he calls it a gut truck, so I'm quoting him. I says, "Hey, Brad, how about you and I have a perfect day today?" You see, Christians don't. I have no idea what God has set for them. That's why we're going to share today. And he says, oh, can we have a, good, a perfect day? I said, in God, we can have anything. We have to believe, though. You can't just run around and not state or claim or believe. you got to believe for things. We have not because we... So I said, let's ask him. We prayed. Well, let me, uh, this is what happened. We're driving down. Uh, We've got to get the Pioneer going to Ording. And you go past the old bulb farm, you know, and all that. There's this truck on our tail revving its engine, you're going to come around. There's three kids in the front seat. Who knows what they're smoking or, <laughs> or doing. And they're just being rude. How many know God's not into rudeness? And they're just, I says, I, I says, hey, slow down, Brad, let them pass. Now, God told me, says that when they pass, turn and look at them, get the driver in the eye, and say, bless you, just like that. I thought, God, aren't you strange? <laughs> I'd like to punch him. <laughs> I know. Don't quote me on that. Okay. Here they come. They turn around, and just the anointing fell on me. And I turned right around. I said, bless you like that. And they went, ah! Slow down, pull over to the side of the room. Maybe they thought I was going to shoot them or whatever. But I never stuck my hand out. But listen, God's power and authority arrests evil. Everyone say Kratos. Iskus. That's your, that's your Greek lesson for today. Kratos means jurisdiction power, and Iskus means be able to come in on the scene and take charge. Hello? Because you and I were born on this planet, Satan was not. Jesus came and stripped him, so he got the planet back and gave us our citizenship back in the earth. Say amen. So we can be with the devil just because of that. Just because we live and were born in the earth, we can put the devil on his place without Jesus. You do it, you did it all the time before God. They just come in and conned you and tricked you. Now we're citizens of heaven. Everyone say heaven. We belong to God, do we not? So we're a citizen of the earth, that's one authority, and we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, that's two authorities. And what does Satan have? He has nothing but lies. So how harassed is your life? People who are harassed, we got to get the good news to them so they could hear what God really feels about them. Can you say amen? And all the wrong things that are going on in their life, Michael, we bring on ourselves, not God. Or the enemy does. So thank God we don't have that. Say amen. All right. So be careful how you treat others. Everyone say respect. So we're going to be we're going to be talking about the kingdom of heaven and its importance for us to understand this. How many know that things are going up price wise? Gas, groceries. If you're focused on that plane and your finances, your focus is wrong. Because we live in a kingdom, don't we? I don't care if gas is 10 bucks a gallon. God will always see that you have a good full tank if you always stay praising and in tune with him. Hello? My goodness, he could cause a cow to wander into your yard. Don't forget to milk it after you take the bag of money out of its mouth. Do you hear me? We, we limit God. Oh, God, you have to do it this way. No, God says, you ask, I'll do it. You believe. Ask, I'll do it, but you must believe. Say amen. How many of you say believe for things and you saw it come to pass? Raise your hands at me. All of you. Yes, all of you. All right, so we're going to cover these areas, these four areas, okay? There is freedom. How many here know that there is freedom as a Christian? How many know God has translated us out of darkness, out of bondage, and put us in the glorious liberty of the children of God? Say amen. amen. 
But we're not to use our freedoms to go back into doing the old stupid stuff again. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, thank God I'm not stupid. <laughs> we're going to see how many times she does that. <laughs> my, when I was two, I did that to my mom all the time. I threw the bowls and stuff on the ground just to see her jump around, you know. Make sure the world doesn't do that to you. And business and all that kind of make you jump around. No, you're calculated. You're full of God, and God's not in a hurry to make a mistake. Whoop, that was for somebody here today, all of us. All right, cover these four things. Number one, walking in God's light. What does it mean? Two, we're going to cover the glorious liberty of the children of God. You have liberty and freedom that Jesus gave you. Can you say amen? You can choose to do anything you want. You could even choose to sin. God forbid, but you have that freedom to choose. Can you say amen? You got nobody forcing you to do anything. And let me just tell you something. Leadership, good Christian leadership, we guide. We don't control. I don't control anybody here. But there is a system that God has placed in operation of this church that I know more about than you will ever know. Because he gave that vision to me and my wife for us to help and bring things forward. So for you to think that you know more about how this church is to be run than I do, I just have to kind of chuckle, you know, because that's just pride. Hello. So the only one that knows how to run this church is who? And I have to really work hard in hearing how he directs me. Now, we're going to be having baptism coming. We've got a wonderful gazebo over here to be installed. I'm waiting for you to get everything adjusted so you can give God's church some time to help come together and put it together real quickly. Can you say amen? And it might take a lot because if you think about it, how busy are you really? How much time? I mean, we have natural things. Listen, there are family situations we have to give ourselves to. There are situations in business and jobs that we have to. And I'm not talking about that. But think about it. Who keeps us over busy? Is it God? I'm going to say it again because some of us don't realize that people have lost their families and lost their wives and stuff because they're married to their job or they're married to the busyness and not enough time with God. Now listen, I'm not picking on any of you. I just don't want you to fall into that. God is not trying to keep you so busy that you can't worship when you need to, when you can't pray when you need to. If you can't get up in the morning without yawning, then something has to be readjusted and you have to note that say, God, you need to help me to be better at managing God so that I have enough time for you first and that all the things that you give me to carry out is not, it's all in priority or not out of priority. Say amen, somebody. It's the truth. Those little foxes can frustrate us so we can't get the richness we need from God. I have a beautiful toaster, and we have one in the back of the church. There's a gorgeous toaster. It's not going to work if you're not plugged in. If I can't get you plugged into God every day, then you're going to have a certain amount of anomalous success and joy, and it's going to be good. But we want you to have a lot more than that. Have life and have it more. There you go. That's what we're working for. And then we're going to cover God's love in display in life. We need to be displaying God's love. Not how irritated we are. Okay. And fourthly, freedom in the kingdom of God. You have absolutely freedom in the kingdom of God, but you need to know what is acceptable, what is good, and what is the perfect will of God. Because there are certain things that we used to do, we used to practice maybe 20 years ago as a Christian that weren't so bad, it was okay. But now things have tightened up because these are the end times. Satan is walking about as a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Have you noticed? And the ones he devours are the ones who are not paying attention to God. So that's why we share the gospel. Say amen. You need to say to your loved one, listen, you really need Jesus in your heart. Don't tell me that. You really need Jesus in your heart. See how you're acting? Oh, 
don't want to be old, that's why I avoid those issues. No, no, get right in and share the truth. Because what if they went to hell and God says, I gave you that opportunity, but you were too shy to share? Think about that. I never thought of that. God brought it up to me one day. I was never shy again. What if I kept from somebody who needed to know, and, and God specifically told me to tell them, it hurts. And I know some of you probably had that happen. I have. But that's not the issue. The issue is we don't continue to let that happen. Amen? All right. Walking in God's light. Go with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. I love reading from the New King James. Now, there's a lot of wonderful translations out there, but the New King James gets to the point quicker. Everyone to the point. You know, what's the fastest way between two places? A straight line. What's the quickest truth with the most healing? Speaking the truth in love. Don't beat around a bush. Okay? So what you're really trying to tell me is... <laughs> All right, you ready? First John, chapter 1, look at verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is what? He uses the word illuminos. Everyone say illuminos. Which means every spectrum of light is involved. God is perfect, so he has spectrums of light that we can't see, that has effect and power in it, that destroys the works of the devil. What I want to tell you is the Shekinah glory is a, is a reflection of that light. You have an outshining of Christ in you if your lens isn't all plugged up with you. It will outshine through you into your life. Now, how tough is darkness when it comes right up to light? Not tough at all. Runs, doesn't it? So why do we get this idea that Satan's so tough? Because we heard religious people, and they talk about the problems and the things they're going through, and they're very real, and they're very important. But we don't base our faith on the experiences of people. Everyone take a breath. Never base your faith on my experiences. Don't base your faith on your experiences because this will happen. You'll keep bringing up the past. You don't live in the past. You live in the present. And so Satan has a marvelous amount of tricks that he uses and runs scenarios on us. Everybody here, how many here are on um, YouTube, maybe Facebook? You're on your phone anyway. How many know your phone has what we call a way of tracking you? And they run rhythms on you, don't they? What do we call that? When, when the phone runs rhythms on you and tries to guess what you want next. And what? Say it loud. Algorithm. Thank you very much. Algorithm. So guess what Satan does? He runs algorithms on you. Well, Peggy, I haven't got to Peggy today. She's just too filled with God. Let's get her to worry about her kids. Algorithm. Oh, she didn't buy that one. Let's run another rhythm on her. That, now listen to me. Please listen to me. 45 years of ministry, I'm trying to tell you, Satan will never stop running algorithms on you. And he will keep trying to bring you into the same pattern of problems. Now listen to me. You can break that by simply doing what God said, loving him, meeting with him, because then you become like the wind, where he's unaware where you're going, where you're coming, because you hear directly from God and not by the suggestion of other people. Oh, that was good preaching. So don't let the enemy run an algorithm on you. It's kind of like go out to buy a new car and the salesman's right there in your face. Know the tricks. We're not ignorant thereof. You have me to help you. Don't, it seems trying to run you to get mad at me. I mean, my goodness, do you know how many people have recently have started resenting me? What do they want me to do, fall down and fail one time so they can have compassion on me? No, I have to do what God tells me to do whether you're happy or not. I'm giving you what God told me to give you. And God forbid 
that you have despising in your heart against any man or woman of God. Doesn't matter. Remember what God warned us about. No criticism of any church or ministry of any degree. Can you say amen? He told us because Satan uses that a lot. Get up on YouTube and see how much comments people putting down this ministry and shoving down this. And just shut it off. You get up to it's a mess. Okay, let's see what God says. All right, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is a message that we heard from him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is what? No darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we go around hurting people's feelings and calling people names, we walk off in darkness, but look at the next phrase, and we do what? No, no, no. We do not practice the truth. People walk on in ignorance and by their mind and not their heart because they do not practice the truth. How many know we're to be hearers and doers of the word? That involves practicing the truth. Amen. Pray, don't ignore it. God's called us all to pray and seek him first so that we're not casualties in our walk. Say amen. Then he goes on, he says... We do not do the truth. And if we say we have fellowship in him and walk in darkness, we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ does what? This actually says, if we read it in the Amplified or some other translations, it says as we walk towards the light, we love God, we interchange our conversation with God throughout the day. He's constantly washing us in blood. Hello? What's the blood for? The blood is your protection. It repels darkness. It has light in it. Did you know your blood's filled with a light? Go ahead and put a flashlight up on your hand sometime. What do you see? You see red blood. It has a light in it. It's called the life of God. And the life is the light of men. Can you say amen? And it projects out of you. But we got ourselves all polluted. We're concerned about this and we're worried about that. No, you let God do all that. You be concerned about obeying him and getting your life into a place where he can use you. Someone say, oh me. Ah. Goes on further to say, so it says the blood of Jesus is constantly applied. How many of the blood is a blot remover? Jesus' precious blood removed our sin. It's a blot remover. How many of you ever had white out back in the old days when you used a typewriter? Ta -ta 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 -ta. Oh, just get the white out and kind of cover it up and then retype it over. Come on now. The blood of Jesus applied daily because you love God and you just converse with him. He's covering you daily with white out. And you like those illustrations. I love those illustrations. And the white out projects light. Hello, excuse the color white, just, you know, white out. See, and we are not aware of it. So you get up in the morning, you need to be aware. Satan's already afraid of you. And it goes like this. Oh, my gosh, Carrie's up. Uh, what's he going to do? Is he going to go grab a cup of coffee and go sit with God again? Let's try to get him distracted. Have somebody call him and call him a beast, or some as asinine thing, and you know, he'll ruin his morning. Remember this. If the devil can't come to you personally, and he can't because you're covered in the blood, he'll send somebody. And he'll usually be a relative or a friend because they have opening because they're your friend. And the message they bring, is it one of positive encouragement? Straighten up your act. You're doing this. You're like that. Listen, Christianity doesn't have the accuser in their conversation. Never say you did, you should, you better. You're doing this. Get rid of that stuff. That's a poison that Satan has put in your mouth. Nobody's always doing this. Nobody's doing that. And when you start being the accuser, you're doing the devil's part. Hello? Everybody is innocent until proven what? So if you got some kind of thing that's telling you somebody's doing something, something, you better rebuke the devil and do it now. 
Otherwise, you'll be a casualty. And I don't want casualties, especially on my watch. Sometimes I can't go to a person and say, look, here's what the Bible says and stuff, because I am the authority guy. Okay? People are afraid of authorities. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Sherry Lewis, come to the office. <laughs> Good, Mike. I remember, I got called to the office several times. I always knew I was in trouble. Now, you, now you're working a job and somebody says, Carrie Alford, the boss wants to see you. <laughs> we feel that way sometimes because the devil's threatening. Threatening, and so if we're not careful, we're liable to step back and go, oh, oh, oh don't do that. First of all, he's yelling from somewhere else. Because the devil isn't camped out in your living room. Say amen. He's not camped out in your life. So he has to yell at you to suggest something. Tell the bugger to move two blocks away in Jesus' name. <laughs> amen. You got to make your stand, having done all to what? Stand. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for almost anything. Gosh. All right. So let us walk in the light. Walking in the light is walking in Christ, in God. How do we do that? We start up meeting with God, and he puts us there. He moves us into that position. Everyone say position. Who are you in Christ? Positionally, you're an ambassador. You're forgiven. You have all these benefits of yours. That's because you're in Christ. Now, if we choose to walk in our own strength, then those things will kind of seem okay, but they're out of reach. How many know that God never promotes a human being unless that human being promotes God? If you, the Bible says if you exalt yourself, you will be what? Humbled. And if you humble yourself, God will do what? He will lift you up. So best way up is down. <laughs> Get on down, sister. <laughs> Literally, it's to humble yourself, and then God lifts you up. But when we start bragging, when we start saying, I did, and I want this, and I did, and I did, and I died, then we're setting ourselves up. Be careful of the eyes. Listen to yourself during the day. How many times do you mention you? Listen to your conversation during the week. Don't get I'm not trying to make you feel bad. People don't know how to receive teaching. A lot of times they think they're getting chewed out. Stop that. No, listen to yourself. But see how many times I, me, we, I, me, we, I, me, we, I, me, and we. We did it. Me, myself, and I. You see? So check it. That's a good monitor to let you know how much you're slipping away and don't even know it. Somebody say, oh, me. Note, don't hide the light. We're supposed to display it. Can you say amen? Matthew 5, uh, 14 and 15, still under the same point, says this. You are the light of the world, and if... And a city set on a hill and cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket or under a lamp, but put it on a lampstand that gives light to everybody who approaches you. Your job is to shine. Somebody comes to you, all their sin, all their life's going to come to record when they look you in the face. Oh, Pastor Kerry. No, I've had it happen. I've gotten on a bus and I had the people on the bus completely start repenting and praising God just because I mentioned God and the presence of God coming out of me. Does that make me any more special than anyone else? No. It just is a way in which I can tell you that you have that too. Now start projecting God out of you and ask God to help you to do that so when people come into your presence, they can see the light. And it will shine and give them hope just out of you. You won't even have to necessarily say anything. You got to see who you really are. Instead of a sinner saved by grace, nasty thought. You were a sinner, got saved by grace. Now you're a child of God. You're being trained. See, man. 
All right, look at your neighbor and say, do you know everything there is to know about God? And then answer say, that's why I have two ears and one mouth. Yes, and I'm kidding with you, so we understand God put two so we can hear close them with ears. All right, let's move to the next point. The glorious liberty of the children of God, Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 21. How many feel a new freedom like you've never felt before? You're not all bound up. You're not worried about this. So we get a freedom. Now, let me explain while you get to that passage. Once we get to applying the word, once the word and God starts working our life, boy, there's a freedom. But let me just tell you from my honest opinion, it doesn't feel natural at first to be so free and so blessed. How many here can register with that? Because you are with you. You live with you. You know the silly things you shouldn't be doing, doing. And yet, because you applied the word and you love the Lord, God has made you blessed. Hands, anybody like that? But it doesn't naturally feel good to the natural man. Because we think, this couldn't be of God. My dad used to say, if it's too good to be true, it usually is too good to be true. But with God, it is not too good to be true. It's absolutely wonderful. But that freedom makes our flesh want to get rebel. Have you ever had a friend that everywhere you took him, bless his heart, always got you into trouble? I had a friend like that, only for a week. <laughs> but everywhere I took him, because he was out of the military, he was in, this is years and years ago out of high school, playing in a rock and roll band, you know. I took him where, everywhere he went, he caused trouble. Went out of his way to cause trouble. He thought that was life. I mean, you know, we're all wanting no trouble. Could you say amen? But we're not going to compromise with the devil to get it, right? So let's look at our freedom. Make sure that your freedom is not an occasion to the flesh to fulfill its lusts, the scripture, okay? So, of course, we're not going to do that. All right, so Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation, that's everything, animals, waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Who's that? You and I. Folks, the animals out there, they didn't fall. Here's one God shared with me. Adam fell, and the animals were affected but you didn't see a lion falling down and say, I repent of my sins because of Adam's sin. All animals, now listen, are in direct fellowship with God. I'm going to say, I'm, and I'm, I'm studying my bird. God says to look at the birds, so I'm looking at my bird, and I'm praying to God, and God is making my bird do whatever I pray. It's in direct communication with God. Why are you sharing that? I'm trying to tell you that's where God wants us. He wants us in direct fellowship with God that we hear him clearly, concisely. But the animals never fell with Adam. They were affected. So this passage here lets us know that all the things that are created are waiting for you and I to become children of God and walk like it and talk like it. I'm telling you, my whole back porch fills up with birds every time I come out. I ask the Lord, are they wanting seed? See, the first answer we do is naturally. Yes, they're wanting seed. No, they want the seed person to give them seed, God said. You are the seed person. The world is starving for your testimony, sharing what Jesus is doing in your life. So the freedom that God has given you and cleansed you of your sin is for you to win the souls of others. Now listen, let me say this to you, what my pastor told me years ago. Your life really begins in heaven, where you have the rest of eternity with no suffering, no more sorrow, no pain. Now there is some steak on the plate while you wait, while you wait for some pie in the sky and the by and by. But you're going to have some issues, you're going to have challenges because you're learning how to walk with God. So I am not saying you're not going to have problems. I'm going to say that you'll be a better person because you'll know how to deal with them better. Can you say amen? Because as long as we're in this world, there's tribulation. But Jesus says, fear not, little flock, for I've overcome the world. 
And by the way, fear not, little flock, because you are in Jesus. There you go. So we've got to start becoming God inside minded, God conscious more, and less aware of the faults and the problems of life. That's why during this time of COVID and all, Satan worked very hard to stir up trouble everywhere so your eyes would be off the Lord and onto the problem. It doesn't stop. He still uses the same old tactic. All right. I'm blessed. Okay, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation itself was subject to fertility, not willingly. Adam subjected the earth to a curse. They didn't choose Adam to do that. Adam did that. And because Adam did that, all of us suffer. Now... Folks, what about an angry dog? What about an angry animal that attacks human? They got a demon. How do you know that, Pastor? Because I've cast them out of animals. Remember the talking dog? Someday I'll tell you, some of the people in the congregation, about the talking dog that I had to cast a double out of. Hateful, spiteful, attacking viciousness, all of this is a product of this planet because of Lucifer in it. Folks, here's something I'm going to throw up, segue off the, off the wall. There might be life in other planets, but they're not visiting us. Let me tell you why. Because we'd kill them. <laughs> Laugh, we would. What we are being visited by are demons. And Satan is fallen angels, which has waited for this time. This is the Antichrist time. He's going to do all kinds of fairy tales. What was the first, first lie given to the church? About turn of the century. Can you remember the lie that you came from apes? What do we call that? Darwinism. Did you know there's trillions of dollars invested in, in preaching you came from apes? They don't dare change it because they're going to lose all that money. <laughs> Bunch of bozos. Listen, that was the first big lie. There is no God. You came from an animal. Wow, what a devastating thing. Having college professors and people who have education. Education is not right if it's not right. The second lie is going to be just like it, except for, I'm going to tell you what it is, so when it comes... You look down and say, thank God I'm not there. The UFOs are coming from another planet. Now, this is the lie. And they seeded us thousands of years ago. Because this is the lie. I have to repeat this. I don't believe this, but I know the Bible. This is Satan's lie. And we are the gods that came and we got you, we caused you in test tubes, and we brought forth the human race out of a test tube program called Eden. That sounds pretty Star Wars. <laughs> Folks, if you read the Bible, the Bible says God brought us out of the earth, not a test tube. Hello? And there's so much of that going around. They're saying that these visitors came and they got together and decided, let's make man in our own image. And they got the test tubes and the, the thing out and they started producing us. And now they're coming back. And listen, if you were an alien from trillions of miles away, what kind of a message would you tell us? Uh, you're destroying the planet. Don't play with guns. Treat everybody nice. You know that comes from the pit. My, that's just, the whole thing is a big manufactured light. Now, here's the problem. The, our government is believing it now. In the 50s, they had an alien demonic person come and live at the White House Pentagon for three years. Are you aware of that? And the person's, the biggest message he had was, we're good, we planted you, and we want you to treat the planet good. And you look at that and you go crazy. Why are you telling us? Because this is the big lie that's coming. They're probably going to land on the White House. By that time, when they come and show up, we're going to go up. Say amen, somebody. 
So that's the next lies coming, if you haven't heard it already. Watch ancient aliens. They're not ancient aliens. They're ancient, demonic, fallen angels that made all that stuff. And they left clues, but we're not so smart. Okay, we need to figure it out. <laughs> I preached myself happy and I got that in. But I, I, that's not the gospel. I'm just telling you reality. And who do you think is harassing you? Who do you think is taking your brother and sister and turning them against another brother and sister? The same little alien flying around in this own little boo-boo. Hello. Here's what happens. A tear in the seam of protection opens up because somebody's playing with the occult and a spook steps in. Don't play with the occult. Don't look, read your fortune, no horoscopes. Hello? Think about it. You're reading for your joy and tranquility a horoscope. How dumb can we be? Smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo. Don't tell me while our president got shot what to do. Church has been sleeping and not being Jesus kind of people. Now listen, it's okay because you're, you're doing it. You are living for God. Bless you. <laughs> You are. But there's a lot more I want to share and teach you about how to live more free, more, more full. How many know that Jesus came to give us what kind of life? More abundant. What does a thief come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. So now you know. Whatever is not of God, you can rebuke. All right, so go on. Pastor Gary, okay, here we go. Let me just look, a couple of points. All of creation was affected by Adam's fall, but they did not fall themselves. So animals are in tune with God. Okay, let's have a demon. Two, the liberty that's in Christ Jesus, we must learn how to submit. Folks, if you want the authority where you command things, you've got to be under the commander. Say amen. And he has to give you jurisdiction so that you can command that actually you're commanding him to go forth. Now, when God told Moses, Moses, you can command me. Did you know there's a place in the Bible where it says where he can command God? Now, listen to me carefully. He's, we're not telling God what to do. We're using his power to take charge. That's what that means. You're a citizen of the world. Is Satan a citizen of the world? I said, is the devil a citizen of the world? No. So you trump him by being, I love that, you trump him by being a citizen of the earth. Are you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Is the devil? You trump him by that. The fact is, not using that power and not using that jurisdiction, he overcomes us because we don't put up a standard. You got a fence around your yard, what's that fence for? Keep stuff out you don't want. You got a gate, what's a gate for? Hello, now we're Christians, we're just open to everything. No, <laughs> no. All right, I'm meddling up. Say amen. Let's go to the third point. God's love displayed in life. People need to see your joy. They need to see your love. They need to see you're happy. And even under pressure, you still are in love and full of joy. Say amen. Because joy isn't a feeling. It's not a happiness. Joy is God inside of you. Now, is there anything that you can experience that make God inside of you sad? No. So tap the source. Stop trying to juvenate your love because when it is in your joy, because when it goes away, you think you lost something. Here's another thing. We put too much faith in how people treat us. If I run as a pastor on how you treat me, what happens if you have a bad day? Do I lose my salvation? 
You see, don't run off of all this outward stuff. Monitor it and everything like that. See how you're doing on your job and all that. But don't let outward circumstances dictate your walk with the Lord. Can, can you say amen? All right. Galatians 5, 1, while you're in, in God's love, says this, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and do not be entangled again in your old habits, in the yoke of bondage. Okay. All right. Freedom in the kingdom of God. All right, so 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 3. God's love displayed in life. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. See, it's like clothing, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. What is that saying? It's saying that you're a different creature now. Stop being like everyone else. You do what God tells you to do, and you love God. Start a tradition. Start a fad. Don't follow them. Go back 20 years. The church were following fads. I, I call it the crazy fad. Well, the, you know, and, and most of them have gone on to be with the Lord, so just humor me. It's where the pastor, I mean, a mighty man of God, and then his wife looked like she'd been through the fruitcake hairdressing. And she looks like she's just untattered and everything like that. And you've got a powerful man of God with an untattered looking person. That's just a God. If you got a, you're in the ministry, your wife should be ministerial. Okay? So I'm not talking about that kind of... But people follow paths. And so everybody else started pooping their hair and doing all that crazy stuff, wearing big eyelashes. Now, listen. I love makeup. I drive a painted car. I love my wife when she does the makeup and everything like that, but you think about it. Think about it. How about if she overdid it and her hair was spiked and she came in one Sunday? You know, she just, we did one of those weird, you would go, God, what happened there? Oh, Lord, deliver us. She's out teaching Sunday school, but she'll listen to this. Because it's so odd from the no. So listen, ladies, you're making everything you do is absolutely wonderful. But you're not trying to make a statement anymore. You're just trying to bless the Lord. Say amen. And if you read Peter, it says, let your, your true beauty come out of your spirit. And let, let it not just try to heap on some makeup. Somebody put their finger in your foundation and make an indent. I mean, my goodness. I'm sorry. Listen, so again, let me emphasize, I'm not against makeup. Please. I'm not against doing your hair, making it short or long, however you love it. But don't do it for attention. Say amen. Yeah. Boy, you sure went a long ways for that. Well, we had to get some giggles out of this serious message. Amen. All right. So, again, it says, well, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon? See, he makes us beautiful, doesn't he? The most beautiful woman in the world is a godly woman. It's a godly woman, folks. And the most beautiful man in the world is a godly man. Because they're sold out to God, and they're beautiful. God put that love on them. Can you say amen? So please God, and your wife will chase you around the house. Oh, God. Please. I'm, t I'm telling you. Love grows when that time comes. Now, a lot of you are single, so please, let's not go too far. All right, now. Thank you, God. <laughs> then it goes on further to say, verse 2, and therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and has not been uh, revealed to us what we shall be. And we know that as he was revealed or as he comes to get us, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. So it's the inward beauty of God and his and light on us that makes us attractive. Can you say amen? Back, I can tell you, back in, when I was a young minister, I had women coming out of the wall. It's an awful thing. 
In fact, before I was even saved, I, I'm a drummer in a rock and roll band. Do you think I have any woman problems? No. Four or five a day. Awful. You know what that did to me? It ruined me because when the right one would come along, am I going to think they're all floozies? Do you understand? They're not. They're not. And so I had to really pray, God, I had a, a weird upbringing. And now I want to settle down. And God said to me, he says, then get your eyes off of the human beings and put them on me. All right. Yeah. I had a minister one time tell me, he said, I can't go to the beach. I said, why? He says, there are women undressed there. I said, they're naked? No, he says, they got bikinis on. I said, man, get your head out of the gutter. My goodness. That's a lust controlling, see. We need to be aware of ourselves. But you know, it's, women are attractive, men are attractive. Let's just get past that. Say amen. So a couple of points. The word says, what matter of love the Father has placed on us? Now we're going to take the rest of our life to learn about that love. Can you say amen? Let me describe it for you. There are four words for love. Okay, say amen. Three of them are human. One is not. So let me give them to you. I'll define them for you. First one is eros. Okay, that is sexual love. Or when you fall in love or fall in love with someone. Hello? Eros love is affectionate, caring love. And we can have eros love towards God, can't we? Okay, eros. Second is Philemon. Philemon, okay? Friendship love. City of Philadelphia. Okay. Philemon, okay, means friendship love. How many here have friends? How many know that in your friendship love it can grow? Yeah. So friendship love is one way, having friends, caring for people, that's good. But it's a human love. When a lot of people tell you, I love you and I appreciate you, Pastor, or I love you and I appreciate you, and then like two or three months go by and they're, now they're mad at you, you see, that's not God's love. That's human love. And it falls short all the time. So don't love your wife or your husband with human love. How dare you? It's like, I told you when we first got married, you'll love this, honey. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> human love. So we got eros, human love. We got what? Philemon, human love, uh, friendship love. And then we have one that's real strange called storge. Everyone say storge, spell it S-T-O-R-E-A, storge. Okay? And it means growing love or partnership love. Like, for example, a husband and wife will grow more in love in partnership. Or they're supposed to. Say amen. That's storky love. How many know that those loves aren't the love that God's talking about? They are not. Because many people have said to me, oh, I love you, Pastor. And then two, three years later, they hate me with their entire life. That's not God's love. Neither are they being godly. If I tell you I love you, it's because God said it was okay and to love you with his love. That means no matter what you do, I'm going to love you with his love. So you don't feel like you have to perform for somebody. Never perform for somebody. Perform for God if you're going to perform. But God's love is agape. Everyone say agape. It means unchangeable, unalterable, unconditional love that never ceases from giving. Does that describe God? We are to love. When you see the word love, most of the time it's mentioning agape. So it says to love your brother means that if your brother pulls a knife on you, you might not want to be there, but you're still to love him in prayer. Can you say amen? The love of God in the heart of a person never turns on somebody. So if you tell me you love me, the first thing I'm going to say to you is, what kind of love are you loving me with to help you? 
If you're loving me with God's love, then it doesn't matter if I blow it because you're still going to love me. Then I don't have to perform in being good for you. Can you imagine how many pastors or politicians now, because of the threat of them irritating their congregation, they congregation fires them, stops paying the money. I was here one time when we had a bad congregation. We had a bad congregation where people wanted to do their own thing, split the church, ruined a lot of that stuff. And one of the things they did to me and Linda is they stopped giving. Which means we had a lot of top ramen. People will do anything, so don't get your eyes on people. Love them with God's love. God's love is unconditional love. It's an extraordinary love that's above and beyond anything that you can muster up. Jesus moved with God's love. It's called compassion. And finishing with you, everyone say, thank God he's finishing. All right, so let's look at this. Freedom in the kingdom of God. Romans 12, this is how we are to behave. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Don't tell me you love me and then turn on me. A poor which is evil, don't like anything that does people harm. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate, one towards another with brotherly love. Okay? With brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Like I always tell you, and I try to say it often, I think you're better people than me. You do? Yeah, the Bible says you're supposed to think other people better than you. That way you don't have to prove anything. I think you're better people than me. That's why I have such fun sharing with you. I'm not here to prove anything. I'm not here to build anything. Gosh, we're blessed. So I'm not trying to be anybody because I am somebody and you're not trying to be anybody. You are somebody. The idea is to settle down and learn who God is in your life and how to walk with him. Say amen. And it goes on further to say this. It says, love one another, brotherly love. Prefer one another. Don't be lagging in your diligence. We'll sit around where everybody else is doing the work. Okay. Be fervent in spirit. That means boiling, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuous steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. We're going to bless somebody with a car here coming up. Pray that it goes well. I need a battery in it so I can drive it around and test it. Nobody sent me money for the battery yet. I should have had it two weeks ago. So I can test that all out, and when I give something, it's going to be something praiseworthy and not a piece of junk. I can't test it. I don't have a battery, and I can't run out and spend your money to go buy a battery for somebody else, unless God says so. All right, so am I asking you for an offering? No, nor a battery. No, just pray that we get one. All right. It's amazing how we read stuff into things. I'm excited. Tires are brand new doesn't have very many miles. It's got a six cylinder, not an eight. It's wonderful. Let's go on. Given to hospitality, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, distributing to the needs of the saints. Bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I had a guy say to me, you know, I hate you and I hate your parents. I hate everything to do with you. He was trying to get my gold. And I looked at him and I says, you know, it doesn't matter what you hate. I love you. <laughs> then they laughed and turned around and walked off. He gave his heart to the Lord two months later. So don't let their faces intimidate you. Be bold, but be wise. Say amen. Then it goes on further to say, be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own eyes or your own opinion. Repay no one for evil for evil. I'll get even. Have regard good things and in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, live peaceable among your neighbors. <laughs> well, I have a few, but they're wonderful. 
I don't hear anything from them anymore. They're not threatening me or telling me to go out into the street and die. Amen. We have neighbors, bless our I went over to help them and volunteer at church to help some things. And they got screamed at the whole time. I was told that I was a nasty person. Now, this is how the devil works. That I should go out and, and be killed in the street, run over by a truck. I mean, the guy's screaming at me this stuff. I looked at him, I just smiled, and I said, boy, I think you got a problem. Walked around, walked out, and his wife's on the phone screaming. Who knows what she was calling? And she's screaming, screaming. I said, do you see the backside of me? That's all you're going to be seeing from now on. We came to help, and you turned us away. Now you say, whoa, Pastor K, not all of the people are going to be around you are going to be happy about you. So when they are, don't be brokenhearted. They crucified Jesus. Hello? All right, say amen. This bless you. Let me quote this for you. This is 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Be ye loved, let us love one another. What kind of love is he talking about? Agape love. Agape love. The kind of love that you see Christy coming over and hugging somebody. You see people caring for one another. I hope that you would love me like I love you in prayer. That you would spend the time that I spend in time for you, praying for you and your family. Amen? All right, so did you get something out of that? How many here felt the touch of God? How many are really on your forehead? Raise it up. Let other people see your hand. Good. Don't lose that. Remember what it is. is a touch of God's compassionate love and building your hedge back on you. You're going to find some peace now. So don't let the enemy sneak back on in. Lord bless you, keep you, watch over you in Jesus' name. May his light shine upon you and his face give glory and favor to you. Lord bless their afternoon. Bless them and know that Pastor loves them, Linda loves them, and most of all, how much you love them. Father, let them be men and women of prayer, men and women of love, and bless them on their job. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. All right.